Hello, that's John Lennon, and I was just wondering if you wouldn't rather hear him sing than me talk. Um, can we do that again? No, we can't. Just kidding. Technical glitch. Hello again. My name's Andrew Jaspin, and I'm a recovering journalist. Let me explain what I mean by this. I'm sure you all know that my profession is in crisis. Globally, and especially in the US, Europe, and Australia, newspapers are in real trouble and crisis. Many are being shut, others are being merged. Journalists are being laid off. And into all of that, I believe that the quality of journalism that you get has declined and particularly, trust in journalism has waned. Only earlier this week, Malcolm Turnbull, the liberal politician, talked about what he called the democratic deficit. He blamed politicians and the media for spin, for inaccuracies and untruths. And he said, you know, they're letting us down, both politicians and the media, because we, the public, deserve a better and more honest public discourse. So today, I'd like to focus on some solutions to that. I want to see how we can rebuild trust in journalism and better inform citizens. Now, I won't go into my background, because Joe's kindly already done that already, but my first jobs in Fleet Street were working for the Times and the Sunday Times, both owned by Rupert Murdoch. I then escaped London and went to Scotland, where I edited Scotland Sunday, The Scotsman, later The Sunday Herald, and I also edited The Observer in London, which is the sister paper of The Guardian. In 2004, Mark Scott, who was then at Fairfax and now runs the ABC, invited me to come and edit The Melbourne Age. And I had four great years there and left in 2008. 2008, by the way, was also the height of the crisis, particularly for newspapers. In the UK, we had a situation where circulations were tumbling and so were the advertising revenues. And as a result, media managers, to keep their jobs and keep their bonuses, as it were, cut costs faster than revenues fall. And of course, the biggest cost of all is journalists. So journalists were taking out. But of course, the journalists that remained still had to get the exclusives, still had to get the scoops. And the real pressure's on them. So guess what they did? Guess what many did? They engaged in dubious, immoral, and illegal practices. You will have all read that there were up to 5,000 phones hacked. And of course, each phone hacked was another exclusive story that nobody else got, because they were snooping in on the private conversations. And now, 40 senior journalists and media managers have been arrested for corrupt practices, including Rebecca Brooks, who ran the operation for Rupert Murdoch's in London. While I was in London, I went to see a play about Fleet Street, a very powerful play written by David Hare, with Anthony Hopkins in the lead role as Rupert Murdoch. At one stage, one of the characters comes to the front of the stage and talks about newspapers. And he says, you know, newspapers are not just a scrap of paper. They're something that you need to trust. And if you don't trust what's in that newspaper, why would you buy it? And that message has stayed with me throughout my professional career. Now, in Australia, we have a different problem of a kind, and that is a highly concentrated media ownership, a lack of diversity. In London, there are 20 newspapers competing a day. Here in Australia, if you're lucky, you have two. Here in Canberra, you have one, although you get some imports. If you live in most of the other capital cities, you have one paper, unless you're in Melbourne or Sydney. And this lack of diversity, I believe, is a real problem. Rupert Murdoch owns, through his News Limited, 70% of all the papers here in Australia and their websites, which means an even bigger reach. 
And the rest is owned by the other big player, or the major dominant players, Fairfax. And I'm sure you also read your papers or websites, and you know that Gina Reinhart, the billionaire magnate, is just waiting to pounce. She's already the largest single shareholder in, in Fairfax, and I believe next month at the AGM she'll make her play to get three seats on the board, which is what she wants, to be able to have an impact in terms of editorial direction of the Fairfax papers, which is largely City Morning Herald, The Age, Canberra Times, and The Fin. Now, I don't have a problem with Gina Reinhart owning Fairfax or Rupert Murdoch owning 70% of the papers. My problem really is we need to have diversity of views. This is absolutely critical to an informed democracy. You need to have pluralism. And of course, here in Australia, you will have read three to 4,000 journalists and allied workers have been laid off by the major groups. This is usually stage one. Stage two is to close papers or to merge them. And for those of you who don't know, The Age and Sydney Morning Herald have been effectively merged into one paper, so two voices into one. And stage three is something we're all watching right now, the collapse of Fairfax, and I don't know where that's going to lead. What does this mean in terms of our media? Well, what's happened is newsrooms have been hollowed out particularly specialists, and by those I mean environment, reporters, science, health, and other specialists, usually the most expensive journalists on the payroll have been taken out. And instead, they've been replaced by generalists, usually cheaper journalists, less experienced, which of course gives you a shallower offering back to the public. Now, in the case of newspapers themselves, they've all reduced in pagination. When I was the editor, I fought this constantly. It's one of the real problems I faced. And I noticed last week the age was down to 14 pages. This is a world-class newspaper, or used to be anyway. 14 pages of which one page was world news and two pages, you'd be delighted to know, were Dan Murphy's. <laughs> Why would you pay $2 for that? And that's really, to me, part of the problem. And I, don't want to, I could spend this entire talk talking about the problem of journalism, but I want to switch now from the problem to a solution. I'd now like to tell you about my journey in search of an alternative model. So, Frieda Fairfax and Editing the Age, which is a real intense 24-7 job, I was able to start thinking afresh, and my mind went back to the meetings I used to have with Glyn Davis, the president and vice chancellor of the University of Melbourne, where we used to share a coffee. And I remember over one of those coffees, him telling me about the university. And we discovered that both the age and the university were both founded within months of each other in 1854. The university is a deep and rich repository of knowledge, of wisdom, of expertise but it has difficulty communi communicating that to the public. Whereas on the other hand, the age has a great audience, but its offering is increasingly shallow. And it just occurred to me, why don't we bring these two together? Glyn thought that was an idea worth pursuing, and he gave me a desk at the university. And he said, just roam around the university. And as I did so, I noticed there was a faculty of law, of medicine, of science, of humanities. It was like walking through a virtual newsroom. My newsroom at the age also had a science desk, a business desk, a humanities desk, an environment and science desk. But this time, the people I met really knew their stuff. Unlike journalists who need to do research and quick research usually, just to know enough about the story to be able to write about it, these people spent their entire lives, their entire prof professional lives, trying to understand problems and offer solutions. And of course, being in the university world, they were freed of commercial, political, or ideological pressures. And I thought, 
I found it. This is the last gold mine of untapped knowledge, and I'm going to find a way to connect this to the public. But then they told me something else, which was terribly worrying, that they'd actually tried to share their knowledge with the wider community, but they'd found the experience so unsatisfactory that they'd just withdrawn. And I was talking to Peter Doherty, the Nobel laureate, professor of immunology, about this problem. And he said, you know what? I've stopped talking to the media, particularly the press, the written press, altogether. I just won't do it. Because every time I give an interview, I finish wondering, I wonder how bad that will turn out to be. Never a good thing, but how bad will it be? And what, do, what he means by that is this. How many factual errors will be in it? How will it be spun in a way to suit the media outlook's ideological outlook? The media outlet's ideological outlet. So he just said, I've just stopped. I won't do it anymore. And then he said to me, probably the most important thing in, in this journey. He said to me, you know what, instead of you sitting across the table from me as a journalist, I'd like you to come and sit next to me. I'd like you to sit next to me and help me write in a way which is readable, engaging, but allow me to honor the integrity of the science and the facts that I have. That's when it all came together to me that we need to have journalists and academics working together. But you know, there's a real difference between academics and journalists. Journalists tend to focus on the problems. So, for example, floods, drought, violence, and so on and so forth. That's, a lot of the times, what we call the bad news. Academics try to seek solutions to those problems. What causes floods? What causes drought? What causes violence? What causes the refugee problem? That's what I call the good news. So, it made me think, is there not a middle way where we can still try and understand complexity, but actually offer solutions? Because if we gave that information out to the public, that would lead to better public conversations, where people actually are armed, empowered with knowledge to be able to make up their minds about complex issues. And if we got that right, that would be something really good for us to contribute. But of course, what we need to do before we go any further is to rethink the way this new collaboration between academics and journalists is going to work. So the first thing we need to do is to build respect and trust between the two. The second thing we need to do is to rebuild trust with readers. So that's why we built the conversation, and that's really what I'd like to now focus on. So how do we rebuild that trust? Well, we had to rethink the way we worked. And we introduced a range of protocols, and I'd like to run through some of these. The first and most important is the only people who can write for the conversation are those who really know what they're talking about. You have to be registered with a university, and we work with all 39 in Australia, or with CSIRO, or the other research institutes. And when you register, you have to list all your expertise, everything you know about the subject, because we only let people write on subjects that they really have deep knowledge of. And of course, you have a right to know who the author is. How often do you read something and you think, what do they really know? And second, we insist that they disclose their funding and also any conflicts of interest. If they're a lobbyist for an organization or, for example, a pharmaceutical company, how often do you again read things? You think, who is this person? And you later find out, actually, they were pushing a barrow. The third thing we had to do was introduce strict codes of conduct, which every one of our authors has to sign up to when they write for us, and so do our editors. We want to have responsible, ethical journalism on our site. And lastly, we needed to make sure that if you, the readers, want to participate in the conversation, you can do so 
but you have to register as well. We won't allow any anonymous postings on our website. And if you do come in, there are community standards, and those communi community standards stipulate you must engage in a respectful and civil way when you engage with our authors and with each other. Now, we've got our own disclosure statement, which I want to make sure I give you, which is we are largely funded by the universities, by CSIRO, by the Australian government and the Victorian government, and also by some corporates, including the Commonwealth Bank and Cause Chambers. And into every one of our funding agreements is written a code which ensures that we, the editors and authors, retain editorial independence. We decide what goes in. We don't have any proprietor telling us to push a certain line. And why would these organizations fund us? Well, first of all, all of us in this room and across Australia put 12 billion a year into higher education and research. And I believe we have a right to know what's going on or what's being, how they're using that 12 billion. And they equally have a responsibility to better communicate out back to us their knowledge. And the other thing is that some of our funders are very worried that Australia is becoming increasingly known internationally as a giant open quarry exporting iron ore to China, Japan and elsewhere. Instead, why don't we flag up that we're also a knowledge economy and we're part of trying to aspire to be a clever country? So, bringing all that together, Peter Doherty, there we are, sitting side by side, ready to go. And we launched last year in March. And bingo, it took off. We were astounded. We launched with the slogan, academic journalism, sorry, academic rigor, journalistic flair. <laughs> and it took off, as I say. We've had eight million visits to the site so far, a third of those from abroad. We now have three and a half thousand academics registered and writing for us, including, by the way, Brian Schmidt, who you heard earlier on, and of course, Peter Doherty. And we have 15 editors, giving us, I believe, the largest virtual newsroom in Australia. Our editors commission the authors who write, and they write fast. And the reason they can write fast is because we give them guidance, and we've got a particular writing platform that they can use, and it means that they can engage in the news cycle. They can do so quickly. And by the way, when we heard, for example, Osama bin Laden was executed, we had a story up within two hours by somebody who really knew their subject matter. And best of all, we no longer have to ask permission from the media gatekeepers to get our stuff out. We go direct. We built a direct pipeline from the universities and research institutes direct to the public. So we can decide what goes out rather than the media gatekeepers who used to focus on the weird or sexy science. We've now got the biggest independent news channel in Australia. And we've actually shown that there is really a market for quality information. And best of all, we've allowed those trusted voices to get out there and be shared by the public. I often think the conversation is as much a democracy project, democratizing knowledge, as a journalism project. And we're committed to ensuring that rather than the lack of diversity, we give plurality and diversity of views in Australia. Let's have a real contest of ideas. That's the basis, after all, of a functioning democracy. And being digital, of course, the conversation is read globally. And we've had people asking if they can share our model. Just imagine for a moment a global service of the world's best minds, free for all. Now that's an idea worth sharing. But one first small step at a time, we need to get Australia right. Now, I'm winding up and I just want to say that once upon a time, I might have ended today in despair about everything I described earlier on. Today, I end in hope. 
And that hope is because of the new digital platform, which is allowing journalists to be able to work in a way which is cheap, quick, and efficient, and avoids all that manufacturing of newsprint and distribution, etc. I call this a journalist heaven, where we can spend all our meager resources and time and energy on ideas and idea creation. And the core values of the conversation, I believe, are also the defining values of 21st century journalism. And those are transparency, authentication, pluralism, democratizing knowledge, and building trust with readers. And best of all, our funding model allows us for you to read this for free, for you to be able to share it for free, and for you to be able to republish for free. So to me, the conversation is our small gift to a functioning, mature, and better informed 21st century journalism. Thank you very much.